Okay, I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker, Patrick Shaw. Patrick is an associate and licensed social worker with over 20 years of experience as a senior healthcare director. Most recently, he was the director of learning and organizational development as well as behavioral health services at Northside Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. Patrick maintains a private practice in Lawrenceville, Georgia and is an adjunct professor for the University of St. Francis and associate professor for the University of Phoenix. And now Patrick's going to share his presentation on four guiding principles for healthcare managers. And now I'll turn it over to Patrick. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this webinar this afternoon. I look forward to uh, spending the next hour and a half with you and hopefully you will find this um, information that we go over today um, valuable and helpful and practical. Also, um, I will be asking questions uh, as we go along to make this uh, participative uh, interaction. So please feel free to uh, unmute your phones or type in your responses as we go along. Um, by, by way of objectives, uh, you've probably seen these already, but I do like to go over them before we start. So we're going to cover uh, five different things this afternoon. At the end of today's presentation, participants will understand the importance of aligning professional behavior with organizational goals. Uh, all of us have um, organizational um, values and mission statements and hopefully our behavior reflects those. We're going to spend a bulk of our time on number two, which is a four, uh, to learn four easy to use management guidelines to ensure fair and equal treatment in the workplace. Um, participants will also identify when we have a responsibility to take action to address workplace issues. Uh, number four, we're going to look at some high-risk legal areas of healthcare management. And finally, uh, participants will learn and model to use uh, objective criteria when making decisions. Also, as I speak this afternoon, I'll frequently use the term we instead of you or manager because I'm a manager as well as a director. And then I use the term manager to include anyone who has a direct report. So it might be anyone from a charge nurse. Uh, you know, all the way up the organization. So I'll use those ter uh, terms interchangeably. Volume would be great. I'm speaking pretty loudly. Oh. You really can't hear this too well? It sounds great on my end, Pat. Okay. Um, introduction, we can skip over this slide. Leslie did an excellent job with the introduction. So let's start by talking about the workplace environment. What would be some of the qualities that you would see in an ideal work environment? Anybody? Some of the things most people will say when we think about an ideal work environment is they want to work in an environment uh, where there's fairness, where there's integrity, uh, where there's trust. Hopefully the organization is profitable. There's ongoing learning. Um, and then, you know, another one might be they have a good boss or a good supervisor. So that would be some of the qualities of an ideal work environment. And some of you also may have worked in an environment or may currently where you may have some concerns that you've seen in the work environment. Some of the things people mention are things like favoritism. Uh, you may work in a, an environment that you consider hostile or a hostile work environment. Uh, you may have a bad boss. Again, probably many of you have heard the phrase that People join companies but leave bosses. Uh, you may have had an organization where there's been some downsizing, consolidation, or layoff. Uh, you might not have the right equipment. Uh, you may not feel like you're being compensated fairly. So those would be some of the concerns people bringing up uh, in the work environment. Now, if you do have a work environment that's not um, ideal, you're going to have some poor performance. You generally have lost productivity lower morale, you may even have some lawsuits or a lawsuit, um, there's employee turnover, patient satisfaction scores, which is you know big on the radar for all of us right now, is generally lower, you may have some fiscal problems, you may have some difficulty recruiting top talent to your organization, and you may have an, even have a situation with a poor work environment or you may experience some type of workplace violence or maybe even bullying in the workplace. So those would be some of the concerns if you don't have an ideal work environment. 
For today, we're going to use the definition that you see on your screen before you to describe an ideal work environment. It's a workplace where all employees are treated professionally and legally. And we're going to go over some of the aspects of our legal requirements as managers. Decisions are made based on legitimate business criteria rather than one's personal characteristics. So as we make decisions in the environment, that we're making it using uh, business criteria, objective criteria, rather than the person's personal characteristic, our knowledge of them, our friendship with them. Fourth, or I'm sorry, third, everyday behavior is aligned with broader business values of the organization. Again, we talked about that earlier, that hopefully we're managing and someone looks at the way we manage and they can say that, see that that reflects the organizational values. And lastly, is that, man, lastly, that managers demonstrate consistent equitable and professional behavior towards all employees. Now, if we don't have this ideal work environment, we're subjecting ourselves or opening ourselves up to a lot more legal risk. The two primary ones are discrimination and harassment. The Civil Rights Act of 1991 increased the legal risks associated with discrimination. Basically, Title VII or the Civil Rights Act, you may be familiar with, uh, protects, or sets up uh, protection for certain classes of people. And companies are held accountable if they discriminate because of a person's race, religion, sex, national origin, or color. So again, when we talked earlier about making business decisions, we want to make it based on objective criteria and not be opening ourselves up to some type of liability where someone can say the decision was made for or against based on a person's race, religion, sex, national origin, or color. Now, fortunately, there are solutions for our, all organizations to help us um, manage and minimize risk, and those are the four that are listed. The organizations have uh, clear policies regarding discrimination and harassment, and probably most of you know where define your policy in your policies and procedures. You may have posters posted up, um, some type of information about discrimination and harassment. Secondly, we need to communicate the policy to all employees, not just managers. We need to communicate that information about harassment and discrimination uh, to all employees and communicate it more than once. It should not be just a once a year or once every couple of year uh, training session. Organizations are also uh, required to investigate and follow up any type of uh, complaint about some type of discrimination or harassment. We're going to go over that. And lastly, this is where sometimes organizations fall down, is that people uh, need to be held accountable. It's great that we have policies, but if we don't enforce the policies and hold people accountable, then um, it's all going to come apart on us. So those are the four um, solutions for employers. There's also some personal risks associated uh, if we don't create this ideal work environment. Courts and employees are holding managers and, uh, personally liable for inappropriate workplace uh, behavior or conduct. Previously, you can probably remember a time where if there was a lawsuit against an organization or against a manager, you would meet with HR and, and get, they would get a lot of information and the company would stand behind you. More and more companies are doing less and less of that. They're, they will support the manager, but only if the manager has followed policies and procedures. And the change is because companies have gotten much more proactive. They're providing the training, and therefore they expect managers to have this knowledge and training. And therefore, if there is a violation or there is a lawsuit against the manager, and the manager hasn't followed the policy, procedure, or law, then companies are less likely to stand up or stand behind them. An example of that is uh, when I ran the uh, learning and OD organizational development department, we did a lot of management training. And any time uh, human resources or employee relations got a complaint of some type of harassment or unfair treatment or hostile work environment, they would call us and they would immediately ask us to pull up the training records of the managers to see if they have attended the classes, they attend the did they attend the mandatory classes? And then if they didn't, why? And if they did, then the managers are held accountable. So now there's more personal risk to managers. It's not just companies assuming the risks. 
This afternoon, we're going to spend the bulk of our time on these four prescriptive roles, and we're going to go into a lot more detail about uh, all of them. But just as an overview, the four rules we're going to be looking at are guide your words and actions, investigate document, get help, be professional and consistent. And by doing those things, we're going to unvo uh, avoid unnecessary litigation. And hopefully, as you look at these four, we're not really asking you to to uh, develop or take on a whole different management style. Hopefully, you're managing in a very professional and consistent way now. And and after the uh, the information you're going to get this afternoon, you may want to uh, make some minor tweaks to how you manage, uh, do things a little bit differently, but it's not going to be learning a whole different management style. Hopefully, these four prescriptive rules are something you can incorporate into your management style um, fairly easily. So let's look at the first one. What do we mean when we say guard words and actions? As a manager, we have a responsibility to guard uh, not only our words and actions, but as the actions and words of our peers, employees, direct reports, customers, and vendors. So it's not just watching how we behave, but being responsible for those that we supervise, those we work with, people that come into our our organization. As an example of that, um, when we had our training classes, um, our building was actually about 100 yards away from the main hospital up the hill. And we would have a lot of people leave our classes or some of the females that work in our um, building walk up to the hospital and either go through and enter the hospital through a loading ramp or through the entrance on the women's center. And there was a time where the hospital was doing some expansion to the women's center, and so there was obviously a lot of construction crew out there. And one of the women, the females in our class, reported that as she would walk back to the uh, hospital through uh, the construction site, the construction workers frequently made uh, inappropriate or sexual comments or, or wolf whistles or just things that made her feel really uncomfortable. So she let her manager know, her manager let her director know, and then the manager actually met with the uh, supervisor of the um, construction crew to say, you know, this is going on, uh, you know, that's not the kind of behavior we um, foster here at our organization, and the construction crew manager intervened so that that, um, that behavior stopped. So that's just an example is as managers, we don't just um, – are responsible for our own words and actions, but again, the people around us, and that may include uh, vendors. Um, also, our comments should never make references to do, that can dif differentiate among employees based on race, sex, age, religion, and color, national origin, or disability. Again, we talked about that earlier. Hopefully, we're working in an, in an environment where we're not yelling or making threats or losing our temper with employees. That does happen. I remember a nurse manager I worked one time, she had put in, I think, a double, and then one of the, uh, her nurses called out, it was a short staffing situation, the nurse called out from the airport, her mom was sick, and this nurse manager kind of lost and really just was ver fairly verbal and yelling at the employee about calling in sick. So again, we need to monitor ourselves and not be yelling or making threats or losing our temper with our employees. We also need to remember that our words and actions apply not only to our verbal statements, but also to things like memos, emails, posters, calendars, and um, Internet communication. And some of you may have had this experience um, where you work, or maybe it's probably less so now, but a number of years ago, where you might have got someone, a forwarded email from someone or a cartoon that was funny, you may have thought, but also inappropriate. So what are the actions or what, are the, what does the organization expect you to do in that situation? Previously, you may have just forwarded it because you thought it was, um, you know, something to share with other people. Um, now you might delete it, but really the, the uh, bar is set much higher. The organization, again, when we think about guarding our words and actions, it's not just about deleting this email. It's also getting in touch with the sender and letting them know that uh, business or that the email um, at work is strictly for business reasons only, for work reasons only. If we get that email from someone's home address and it's a friend of ours, colleague, uh, spouse, whatever, 
that we and get in touch with that people again. Remind them that and while I'm at work, you know, my email at work is strictly for our work stuff. And this kind of uh, uh, joke or cartoon that you sent to me is really inappropriate for work. So really, we do have a responsibility to not just guard our words and actions verbally, but again, uh, memos, email, uh, those kinds of communication. Secondly, or lastly, the other point I wanted to, to make about guarding our words and actions, an easy way to think about it is thinking about the words on stage or off stage. And on stage and off stage are really uh, terms that Disney uses. Disney uses the term on stage and off stage for what they call their uh, cast members or people that work there. And when they're not in front of all the thousands of customers that come through, their uh, park every day, they're off stage, and they might be in a workroom, a break room, um, even off site, but they're off stage. The important thing here, when we think about guarding our words and actions, is that as managers, we're on stage all the time. Our employees, those people we supervise, are watching our behavior all the time. Not just when we're out with them, but you know our phone conversations, when we're with other people, when we're in the cafeteria. So again, we're on stage all the time, and we need to be guarding our words and actions in all types of environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So what are some of the business reasons why we want to guard our words and actions? Well, inappropriate comments and behavior may damage the employee trust in your capabilities as a manager. It would certainly destroy your credibility as a manager, and you know that's one of the biggest things we have going for us as a manager is if our people see us as credible, if our employees see us as um, being credible. But if we're telling jokes or sharing things that are inappropriate or making comments based on one of the Title VII protected classes, that will certainly impact our credibility. It also creates an uncomfortable or hostile work environment. And lastly, the last business reason is if we're not guarding our words and actions, it helps establish liability for unlawful behavior. So if we end up in court, you know, we might not have much of a defense, especially if we have courses about this kind of behavior. The second one, the second prescriptive uh, rule is investigate and document. And clearly documentation serves to create and store a history of events. When we document, we want to document what people say. We want to be very specific. We want to document only facts. We want to in inter interview everyone that's involved. And we want to document the information, what actions we took. And documentation serves to create a history of events and solutions. Just think for yourself if you're trying to remember what you were doing or how you may have interacted with an employee, you know, for example, a year ago or maybe even last week or tr trying to think through the timeline of things you did this past weekend with the people that you interacted with. So the documentation really creates a history, same as the documentation in a medical record um, would create a history. For those of you that have been through Joint Commission or any other type of regulatory review, you'll hear, you've probably heard the phrase, if it wasn't written down, it didn't happen. So documentation is really a way to, uh, to create a history that is uh, preserved and can be recalled at a later time. Interestingly, I got a call this Sunday morning from a uh, colleague of mine from uh, two years ago. And he was asking me about an event that occurred because he just received a deposition or a request for a to go this week to give a deposition. So he was going with uh, over the timeline with me to make sure that he had his facts in line with the event that occurred. It didn't have to do with client care. It had more to do with some processes and some situations. But again, the documentation creates a timeline, and it can be um, um, brought up later if we need to. And again, lastly, when we document, we want to be objective when we document as well. Not, and we want to document just facts, not um, our personal opinion about things. So, you know, what happened? Um, how did it happen? Why did it happen? Not necessarily why did it happen, but, you know, why, um, how did it happen? The business reasons for document, documentation is clearly documentation is more accurate 
than memory. You know, again, the way I like to think about it is if you were, if you were uh, in court and an attorney was asking you questions, it, I would feel much more comfortable if I had my documentation in front of me. Also, as you can see by the second bullet, records can be used as evidence in court. And in fact, it's not just um, our notes, but it can be, you know, emails can be retrieved, memos can be retrieved, even voicemails can be retrieved. I have a client now in my private practice, and uh, his ex-wife has left him a lot of uh, inappropriate um, accusatory remarks on his voicemail. He took it to the uh, judge, and he has a restraining order against his wife based on that. So again, those kinds of things can be brought into evidence in court. The third prescriptive principle is getting help. Think about the things that you know and the things you don't know. I know for myself there's certain things I know pretty well, but if it's a computer problem, you know, I don't know a lot about how to fix computer problems, but I know who to call to find out. So I would call information uh, technology or IS. So when we think about the concept of getting help, it's the idea that we don't have to know everything, but we should know what we don't know and get help in terms of um, those things we don't know. So where do we get help? Well, we can talk to our boss. We can talk to human resources. We can talk to risk management. We look at our policies and procedures. Those are great guiding principles about, about the things that we need to do or the steps we need to take. But the key here is, did we get help? And also, when you get help, you can think about it in terms of a medical consult. Doctors don't know everything, and if they don't, hopefully they're consulting with other people to come up with the best decision. So the third progress or prescriptive principle is to get help. And again, when we get help, if we do end up in court, it's looked much more favorably at by the, by the judge or by the court. The business reasons, employment decisions must be consistent. So we may know how to do some things in um, our own department, but we get help by contacting HR because they know how it's done and how it may be handled across the organization. For example, a time attendance violation. The second one I already went over about uh, joint, joint decisions are viewed more favorably by the court. And again, the organization's position is improved when, one, when several people rather than one makes um, a decision. The last uh, prescriptive principle is be consistent and be professional. It's our job as managers to know uh, companies' policies and to communicate them with employees, for example, time and attendance or accrual or progressive discipline. We want to use legitimate business cr criteria when making employee decisions. We don't want our own personal feelings to de determine our actions. Uh, for myself, re or a couple years ago, um, one of the employees that uh, worked under me, there was a supervisor between us, or a manager between us, um, falsified some of his billing, and the manager you know, immediately wanted to fire him. Well, we had to consult with HR, we had to investigate, but it was also someone I knew for a long time, so that was one where you know, it was very difficult for me, but I can't let my personal relationship with him get in the way of us following our um, company policy. In that particular case, it was difficult, but we did have to uh, terminate that person's employment. So again, we want to be consistent. We want to be pro professional. Um, we also want to focus on the problem and not the person. We don't want to make, ba make assumptions based on what our employees bring to us. For example, you know, uh, health care is primarily an um, environment that is probably about 80% women. And so someone may come up to you and make an allegation that a male employee may be harassing her. Before we jump to the conclusion automatically that that's true, we want to make sure we document all the facts, create a safe environment, and investigate. So again, we want to be consistent, professional, focus on the problem and not the person. And the business reasons for being consistent and professional, Inconsistent treatment of employees may uh, constitute unlawful discrimination. Again, we talked about that earlier. If we're not based our decisions on being consistent and professional, someone may say it had to do with their uh, race, color, age, disability, national origin, or sex. And then also we want to create an ideal work environment so employees have a right to work in an environment where organizational rules are fairly applied to everyone. And then lastly, if we do follow the four prescriptive rules, hopefully we're going to un avoid unnecessary litigation. 
Now, there may still be times where someone's going to bring a lawsuit. People can do that anyways. But as that lawsuit is brought forth and we, and we get interviewed by human resources, if we follow the four prescriptive rules, we're going to be in a much stronger position to defend ourselves as well as defend the organization. So again, following the four prescriptive rules will avoid unnecessary litigation. And the reasons for it, of course, is that the court is expensive, it's time consuming, we don't know how juries are going to uh, respond. You have 12 people up there, they all may be working, they may all be um, um, not in a management position, they may actually side more with the, with the person than with you as a manager. Also, um, litigation is very costly. The image of the hospital or yourself might be you know, on the news or in the new, uh, newspaper. So of course we want to avoid going to court. It's a no-win situation. So let's look at a particular case of harassment. You have in front of you a memo. The memo is addressed to you. It's by another manager. He's asking you what he should do. He's asking for advice about one of his employees, Jean. Jean has had problems getting her reports done. Uh, she's not completed some of her assignments. Coworkers have complained. She's received uh, three verbal warnings, two written warnings, uh, four coworker complaints, and she's also gone to a couple of classes. And he's asking, in this particular situation, what should I do with this employee? So what do you think we should do with this employee? She's been, she's been warned. She's gotten uh, verbal written warnings and attended extra classes. And other people in similar situations have been terminated. So in this particular class, or in this particular case, the person has been counseled. They've got the training. The person, this manager has documented. So the next step may be we need to terminate this person. We've gone through all the uh, progressive disciplinary steps. And so we recommend that to this manager, you know, you probably need to terminate Gene's employment. Well, would our decision be the same if we found out that Sam occasionally commented on Gene's looks or the clothes she wore, or if Sam made rude or inappropriate comments about Gene to others, or if Sam was telling dirty jokes uh, to Gene? So he's got all this documentation about what he's done, but he hasn't really told the whole picture. So what if we found out Sam was doing one of these three things? Would our decision then change, or would we rethink Gene's termination? In this particular case, we can see that Sam violated the prescriptive rules. He did not guard his words and actions. He did document, but he didn't document the complete picture. He didn't document his actions. Uh, he did ask for help in terms of he asked us what we should do in this specific situation, but he probably should have asked um, human resources as well. And if Jean does, in fact, file a lawsuit, which she did in this particular case, what is on trial at this point in time is uh, Sam's credibility. So no longer is Jean's termination on trial, but it's really Fred, um, Sam's credibility. So basically, Sam has created additional risk to the organization and to himself. And our goal is, again, to minimize uh, opportunities for litigation or to minimize business risk. So had Sam followed the prescriptive rules 100%, then he may have had a better case to terminate Gene. However, since we learned that he may have made some comments to Gene or jokes about Gene's or, or about Gene's clothing, Sam's credibility is in trial and his case falls apart. He, he basically creates additional risks for himself. So this is a case where we might look at sexual harassment. And there's two types of sexual harassment, quid pro quo and hostile work environment. Quid pro quo basically is Latin, which is this or that. And it involves an instance where a manager makes it clear to an employee that his or her job and or benefits are dependent on an exchange, on, upon an exchange of sexual favors and follows through. This is illegal and recognized as most serious by the courts. So this would be a situation where an employee or a manager may promise an employee a promotion if the employee agrees to date him or go out with him or her or threatens to reassign this employee if his request or overture is rejected. Again, sex, sexual harassment, quid pro quo, very serious, very um, frowned upon by the courts. The second one is a little bit more subtle. It's what we call hostile work environment. 
in a hostile work environment it can be a one-time occurrence or it can be reputed, repeated sexual or other behavior that pervades the workplace and makes it very difficult for someone to work. A one-time occurrence could be, and this is actually here are some examples I'm aware of, someone once brought in a very offensive uh, racial cartoon and put it on the time clock where everyone would see it when they clocked in. And this employee complained to his boss, it was a union organization, and that com complaint was founded. It was a one-time uh, situation. Something may also be repeated. It might be someone who comes into a work environment where their boss is making demeaning comments every day. It might be a situation where they're telling jokes that are inappropriate every day. It might be a male commenting on a female's uh, attire every day. And so it creates a hostile work environment where it makes it very difficult for this employee to um, work. I know another situation where an employee uh, came and complained because one of her colleagues was making religious uh, comments which to her because she wore a cross to work every day, and she said it made it very difficult for her to work because of these constant uh, religious comments in the workroom, in the break room, uh, up and down the hallway. And so we investigated, we disciplined the other employment, uh, the employee. Also with hostile work um, situations, the comments are offensive to a reasonable person. Now, everyone on this call would probably say they themselves are reasonable people. And your definition of reasonable may differ from some of the other callers, may differ from mine. The point being, what someone finds uh, offensive or hostile can differ from, from person to person. So that's why we need to monitor the work environment for everyone, because we're not sure what people are going to find to be uh, hostile and, uh, and offensive. Again, so, um, in, in the case of Sam, he didn't guard his work, word and actions. His documentation was incomplete. He did get help, but he didn't lo uh, let HR know the full extent of his behavior, and his behavior was not uh, professional or, or um, consistent. So again, this in the, in the case of Sam, you know, this is a clear example of sexual harassment. Now, the Supreme Court has also provided very strict guidelines to, have, to help us deal with um, sexual harassment. They've given uh, a roadmap for the employer, the manager, and the employees. For the employer, the organization, uh, the organization is, is expected to have policies that prohibit discrimination based on the Title VII protected classes, again, sex, race, age, color, national origin, disability, and religion. The organization is expected to have a complaint system with multiple options. So if someone doesn't feel comfortable bringing up a situation to their boss, you know, there might be a corporate compliance line, there might be a hotline, an 800 number, or they might bring their complaint to employee relations or um, human resources. The employee is also expected um, to investigate and take action immediately. Now, some complaints, for example, staff abuse or an allegation of staff abuse or sexual harassment requires immediate um, intervention. Others, we may have 24 hours to inv investigate. For example, if it might be like a time clock or uh, violations. So certain things we need to investigate uh, immediately. Some we can take our time, and not take our time, but take a little bit more time to investigate. But we are expected to um, investigate all of these. We're also expected to communicate policies in a clear manner and communicate it frequently, and we're supposed to train on the policies and what it means and what actions we're supposed to take. So that is, that is some of the um, expectations of the employer. Now, the managers also has, uh, the Supreme Court has set down some expectations for the manager, for all of us. Um, the Supreme Court has said that, it, that uh, the manager is expected to monitor their workplace, including understanding the, the policies, communicating the policies, and taking action. Again, we talked about this earlier. The easiest way to do this is to remember the first prescriptive rule, which is that we are on stage at all time, and therefore we're monitoring our words and actions and those that report to us, colleagues, vendors, uh, customers, direct reports, um, and everyone we work with. Lastly, the Supreme Court has also put some responsibility on the employee. 
the employee must also guard their words and actions. So it's not just managers who are expected not to um, or to refrain from jokes and uh, inappropriate behavior, but employees are expected to as well. The Supreme Court has also ruled that, ruled that employees must utilize internal processes before pursuing action with um, following up on federal lawsuits. So, for example, if an employee has a complaint and they bring it to a court, the courts are going to see if the employee has first followed their own internal processes, which is usually, again, corporate compliance or employee relations or human resources. And if they had not, the court is going to send them back to work with their employee first. Employees are also expected to speak up if they feel any type of violation, um, any type of harassment or hostile work environment. So there is some responsibility placed on the employee as well. So ways we can minimize the risk of se sexual harassment. Again, managers are, know the policies and respond quickly. We don't want to make jokes about sex um, or make any comments about sex or ethnic ethnicity, national origin, disability. And if we do, perhaps, or we have in the past, we want to apologize and take responsibility for it. We also want to monitor our work environment to see not just that we're protecting ourselves, but just kind of what's going on in our work environment. We don't want to uh, manage from, you know, behind a desk. An example of this would be one of uh, the trainers that worked for me went to one of our other hospitals one time to do a training, and as she was walking into the uh, staff break room, they have different things posted, you know, pictures of dogs or pets or whatnot. Um, and someone had also posted up on the break room door a, ca a cartoon that was really um, um, racially offensive. So, you know, having taught this course a number of times, our trainer talked to the manager, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, away from the group, you know, saying, yeah, I saw this cartoon up there. Remember what we talked about, gardening our words and actions, monitoring our workplace. You know, this is really inappropriate. And the manager, after the meeting and away from everyone else, took that down. So, again, it's important for us to monitor um, our work environment. Um, We want to immediately stop any sexual-oriented uh, workplace and, uh, conduct. And again, we may work in an environment where there might be a lot of joking around. People have worked together a long time. They don't think people are taking it personally. You might work in an environment where there's a lot of touching that may or may not be okay with your work environment. Um, so we really want to monitor that. Also, we want to be we want to avoid becoming romantically involved with those that we uh, work with, especially direct reports. Now, again, most people or many people will meet, uh, you know, people that they get involved with at the workplace. That's not unusual. That's where we spend a good portion of our day. But if it's something we directly, if it's someone who reports directly to us, what we want to do then is talk to HR, explain the situation, and they'll help set up a situation where the person that we, that we may be involved with no longer reports to us directly and, you know, doesn't lose their job or anything like that, but it creates a safer environment and, again, minimizes the um, the risk. Again, as I said earlier, since the healthcare environment is 80% women, you know, males especially need to be kind of guarding their words and actions, maybe even to a heightened sense. You know, you don't want to be making comments about what, you know, you look really attractive in that or that outfit looks good on you. You want to be careful if you're having one-on-one -on -one sets of discussions with females in your office. You might want to have someone there. You might want to have the door um, uh, open somewhat. Because, again, you want to make sure that you're protecting yourself and minimizing your risks. So in summary, sexual harassment is serious. Behavior does not need to be uh, egregious to contribute to a hostile work environment. It can very, be very subtle. I had a nurse manager one time tell me about a doctor who would really crowd her personal space. Uh, when he went over doctor's orders, reviewed client charts, he started to put his hand on her um, her. Um, arm. She told him not to do that anymore. Uh, then he started to fax her actually some inappropriate cartoons, which he thought were funny. So this, again, constituted a situation which needed to be investigated and can be considered a hostile work environment. Organizations have a duty to inform employees about the policies regarding harassment and discrimination, and employees have a responsibility to speak up and follow policies as well. So let's now talk about the duty to act. Some of you may be in a, in a profession, myself, I'm a social worker as well. 
where you have a duty to um, in, uh, inform or duty to warn if uh, certain situations come to your attention. For example, some type of you know abuse situation. You have a duty to warn. What we're going to talk about is the duty to act. So if we look at the diagram in front of you, this is you right here. You're this um, manager in this boat, and you're just kind of sailing along, and everything looks pretty good to you. This is you, you, know, you got your horizon out there. You don't see anything going on. Now, below this water line is what we you, you see this big triangle that says um, business risk. But you don't really see that because it's below you. So you don't really have to worry about that right now because it's below you. However, if you were to become made aware of it, then you do have um, some responsibility. So let's look at the next slide. OK, here you are. You're this manager. You're sailing along, and everything's OK. Then all of a sudden, the water line drops. And now you have a duty to act because you, you become aware of certain um, situations. The duty to act that managers have occurs when we see a violation of either law, policy, or safety. So it could be something like a violation of maybe a law, a federal law like family, uh, FMLA. It could be a policy we see a violation, or we could see someone um, put someone in, in a situation where there's a safety issue. But when we do become aware of any of these, we do have a duty to act. And you may become, we may become aware of any of these violations either through a direct complaint you see over on the right-hand side of your screen. Someone comes, comes and tells us directly that something's going on. They may say, tell us, for example, that someone is sleeping on the third shift. Um, or it might happen because it's, it's a direct observation. We see someone maybe clocking in inappropriately when we're monitoring their uh, time and attendance record, or it may be a third party telling us that something's going on, someone from, the, from a different department. But once we, hear, once we become aware of any one of these type of violations, we do have, as a manager, a duty to act. We have a duty to investigate, to find out what's going on, to get help, to document, and to take some type of action. If we fail to uh, investigate, then not only are we responsible for um, all these violations up here, uh, right here, but we also may be responsible for all these small triangles underneath the business risk that we see in the big trial. For example, if, if we found out uh, about Sam's situation, that might be our big triangle, and we know that he's uh, made inappropriate comments to Gene. If we don't act on that, then we, be, we may become responsible for any other violation that Sam may be doing. If he's making those comments to Gene, he may well be making those to other employees. And those, are, those we would be held accountable as well. So again, we have as managers a duty to act. And here again, what we said earlier um, is that it, we find out about through a direct complaint, direct observation, or a third party. Now let's think about the trust between a manager and an employee. What if an employee comes to you and say, I want to talk to you about something, but please don't say anything to anyone? Or what if they say, an employee comes to you and says, you know, John has harassed me, but please don't say anything. It will only make the situation worse, and I can handle it. What do we do in that situation? Again, as managers, we want to you know, create trust with our employees. We want to honor their requests. They want us to keep it confidential. And then we've been to a class that says we have a duty to act. So in this, in this particular situation, if an employee does come to us and confides in us about some type of violation of policy, law, or safety, even if the employee says, you know, I'll handle it on my own, I don't want to upset this other person, it will only make it worse if you do something, we still have a duty to act. And what we tell the employee is, you know, I hear what you're saying, I will keep as much confidential as I can. I am responsible as a manager to, to intervene in this situation. I want to create a safe environment for not only yourself, but for everyone that works here. And then we do act and we do investigate. Now, the employee may also choose and say, well, you know, I want to, I want to talk to you about something. Can you keep it confidential? And if we explain the whole confidentiality 
piece that we really can't, they may say, well, I'm not going to tell you anything. In those situations, we still have a duty to act. We then, even if the employee leaves our office, doesn't tell us anymore, we still have a duty to try to find out what's going on so that we can create a safe environment, not just for this employee, but again, for all employees. Again, if we think about Sam, he may have made, been making comments not just to Gene, but to all employees. So again, duty to act. The business reason behind duty to act, act is again, because when we cho choose to ignore a violation, it suggests that the organization and we, uh, we um, support or are okay with that violation. Also, if you take no action, you risk allowing inappropriate behavior to continue. Prompt and corrective action can minimize and even eliminate liability. So if we do act, we do end up in court, we do bring our documentation, the courts are going to see that we heard about something, we investigated, we documented, we created a safe environment, and that we um, acted appropriately according to the four prescription rules, and therefore we're decreasing our liability and minimizing our risk. Again, it's a legal requirement. It's not something we can choose to do or not. This is something that we are required to do, and it's, it's in all situations. Our HR manager gave an example one time um, where after getting her lunch, she was walking through the cafeteria, and she had a meeting to get to, and she heard a couple of uh, employees in the cafeteria where there's patients um, joking around uh, with racial uh, jokes. You know, it would be easy to walk away from that, but you know, we're held to a higher standard as manager. So she went over and said something to the employees, as well as letting the employee's um, boss know what was going on. So we do have that legal requirement to act. How do we carry it out? We stop any behavior we see. We make sure we investigate these things we talked about earlier. We don't want to over or underreact. We want to document, and we do take action. And sometimes that's difficult. To think, for example, if you ever arrived at a meeting early and you know, you're there with people you work with all the time, maybe all the time, maybe even people at your same level, and they're sharing jokes or things they've heard over the weekend that might be inappropriate. We do have a duty to intervene and remind people that you know, based on this class I attended, based on our um, standards or based on our mission and values, that that's inappropriate. Again, we want to document only facts. We want to be objective. We want to document dates, names, and times. We also want to be very specific. When someone comes to us, for example, with a complaint of sexual harassment, we really want to ask that employee, even if it's uncomfortable, what specifically did the other person say? And write those words down exactly. We don't want to write down that the other person made uh, uh, lewd comments or inappropriate comments because inappropriate may vary from person to person. We want to write specifically what they what they put down. And if they're not comfortable saying that, then we just hand them a piece of paper that says, you know, I know this is uncomfortable, it might be embarrassing, but if you would just write down what he said. We also want to doc or, uh, include our signatures, who we talk to, what actions we talk, um, and also what policies may be applicable. So we do want to document all those kinds of things. It's important to talk about retaliation at this point because even though someone brings up something to us and it might not be founded or it might be without merit, we cannot retaliate against an employee for bringing a concern up to us. And employees need to know that they're protected against any type of retaliation. For example, I had an employee come and talk to me one time about concerns he had uh, about his boss, which was a manager who reported to me. Um, and so I went to investigate that, and then he called me later in the day and said, well, I just wanted to let you know, since I've come to talk to you, I am no longer working this weekend. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the manager has taken me off all those weekend shifts that I was scheduled to work, which was some overtime for him, and needed to, we needed the coverage. And so clearly this was a, a potential for retaliation, and as I investigated and we looked at the timeline, it was pretty clear that the manager found out the employee came to talk to me, although I never let him know. He just found out. Uh, and then once he found out, he retaliated by uh, taking the employee off the overtime shift. So employees need to know that uh, we as managers and the organization cannot retaliate against them for bringing up some type of complaint, um, even if it's unfounded or founded or not have merit. 
So the way we do that, this is a welcome model. That's something we find very helpful. You know, we ask open-ended questions. We ask for input. We explain what we're going to do. Um, we don't roll our eyes. We don't give heavy sighs. We document what people are saying. And we let, we let people know we really appreciate you bringing this up because we do want to create a work environment where everyone feels uh, safe and protected, and we will follow up. Now, we might not let them know everything we do with follow-up, but we do want to let them know that we will investigate and follow up. So in summary, all forms of, har of harassment and inappropriate behavior require intervention. Inaction implies the organization is okay with it. Uh, employees are protected, are protected from retaliation. We should definitely consult, consult, I'm sorry, consult with human resources when we investigate complaints. And that violations of law and our policy supersede the trust that goes on between a manager and an employee. Again, if someone comes and talks to us confidentially, we need to explain the limits of confidentiality. Let's turn our attention now to the case of mutual banter. Have you ever worked in an environment where coworkers joke around uh, and make jokes that may also include jokes related to race, sex, ethnic, or religious comments? Um, you know, those things are inappropriate. You also may have worked in an environment where it's difficult, uh, where some behaviors create, create a difficult work environment and be considered hostile, where people are kind of joking around. There might be some pushing, shoving going on touching some departments, I've heard about this, where you, you know, people are massaging each other. This mutual banter, this type of, type of environment can be that tip of the iceberg where we talked about earlier. There might be a lot more going on underneath this if we allow it to continue. So again, we need to guard our words and actions and also monitor our workplace and remember that we have a duty to act. So if we see this going on, we need to stop it immediately, we need to investigate, we need to uh, make sure we know what's going on and make some kind of follow-up. We want to minimize um, business risk. And again, the first bullet point talks about the Title VII violations, but mutual banter can also refer to comments that are insensitive, divisive, and basically split a department apart. So let's talk about mutual banter. Is, it, is, it, is mutual banter okay if no one complains? Well, the answer is no, because someone might be offended and not want to speak up. Again, if you think about someone new joining the department that's been together, they're brand new, that they see this going on, they say, well, that's how it goes here, and they might not feel comfortable uh, speaking up. But yes, it, if no one complains, we still have a responsibility to intervene. If the, what if the mutual banter takes place in a conference room farther away from anyone else? Again, that's a violation, and we do need to... Um, intervene because it's a common space, it's a work area, and most organizations do not support that kind of environment. What if a mutual banter, the joke and the inappropriate comments occur uh, at lunch uh, off-site? That depends. If it's an off-site uh, lunch that the company's paying for, then yes, we do need to um, intervene. If it's one that's off-site and the uh, company is not paying for it, we may not need to intervene. And that goes to the, to the last bullet point. What if the mutual banter occurs at a Christmas party in the manager's house? Again, if the company is not paying for it, we technically do not need to intervene. But if you think about it, if that, if that type of behavior, if that kind of joking around, if those kinds of um, ethnic, racial, or stereotypic comments are being made uh, at someone's house or at a luncheon and the company is not paying for it, even though we not technically have to intervene, those comments are going to be carried over when people return to work later that afternoon or on Monday. Things that are said off-site, just because it's off-site, it doesn't mean people uh, forget them. So if we're making inappropriate comments, if we as a manager are joking around or participating in it, our employees are going to see that off-site. They're going to wonder about how we're going to manage once we're back on-site. So technically we don't have to intervene if it's off-site we do um, want to be very cognizant and aware that that may impact the workplace. So the definition of, of a workplace is any organizational property at any time. Uh, again, examples, a company picnic, a happy hour if the company's paying for it. Um, and then again, as I said earlier, risk, we do have risk even if the mutual banter occurs someplace other than a workplace, again, because people aren't going to forget that. 
So let's talk about humor in the workplace. This is what we call a workplace circle. This is something you can take back and work with your departments on if you think it's a concern in your area. When we think about the things that people talk about at work, you can see we talk about things like vacations, hobbies, sports, careers, children, uh, pets. We might even talk about work at work. Um, but there's certain things, that, and we might even joke about those things, and that's okay. But as you see that one slice of pie that's carved out, those are the type of things that we cannot talk about, or I'm mean, sorry, we cannot joke about at work. Again, it's the protected classes. So if those things are going on, we need to have a discussion with our employees and say, you know, these things that we might have joked about in the past, you know, we really can't joke about or we need to intervene immediately. And there was an example of that. We had a manager attend one of our classes, and when he saw this, he goes, oh, my gosh, you know, my department, which was environmental services, we joke about this kind of stuff all the time. We work together. It just kind of helps us go through the day. What am I going to do? And we said, take this information back and explain to them that you went to a class you learned about things that we can and cannot talk about or joke about at work. You know, you, you, you admit that you used to participate in it, that, you know, we need to cease and desist with this kind of behavior at work. It doesn't mean we can't have fun at work. It doesn't mean we can't have close relationships at work and joke around with people. But we don't want to be joking around about the protective classes. And, again, if this is a concern that has been going on in your environment, it's easy to take this back and say, just like you would if you learned about uh, a new joint commission standard or a new piece of equipment. Yeah, I went to a class, I learned some new information, and this is what I learned. And so again, we can take this kind of thing back to our employees. How do we minimize this risk? We identify inappropriate mutual banter. We communicate our standards. Uh, we set an example. We talked about that earlier, guard our word and actions. We uh, apply rule number four cons uh, about consistency. And again, we get help if we're not sure. So again, guard your words and actions, investigate and document if we need to, be consistent and professional at all times. And again, it's not unusual, unusual for people to think about places they've worked in the past or maybe where you work now where some of this may have went on. Departments work together. You get pretty comfortable with each other. You have a certain culture in your department. But we just need to know that we're really increasing our business risks and the risk to ourselves and the organization if we allow it to continue. So in summary, uh, inappropriate mutual banter may be a part of a broader issue. Again, the tip of the iceberg. It's going to affect your workplace in a negative way. Managers must act on the inappropriate behavior, even if someone speaks up. Again, you know, someone might not speak up and they might be offended because it might be, you know, their, their wife might or their spouse might belong to a different ethnic uh, um, uh, culture or origin and you might not know this or might have a disability. So again, we, they might be offended by being afraid to speak up. When we talk about business decisions, we talk about making business decisions based on two types of criteria, objective and subjective. Objective criteria are based on uh, things that you can actually measure or see. Um, and it might be things like you know years of experience on a job application. It might be the degree someone holds, the number of people who are supervised, uh, number of FTEs uh, the person has under their uh, as direct reports. It might be budget information. So again, objective criteria, they're measurable, measurable factual, they may be documented, and they're tied to business objectives. So we want to make decisions based on objective criteria. We're going to go through an example in just a minute. Subjective criteria, on the uh, other hand, are matters of opinion, preferences, and assumptions. And subjective criteria may be OK, but they're not generally OK in the workplace. So for example, you might be at a store and decide to buy a certain uh, item just based on marketing, packaging, and not basically on um, objective criteria based on facts. For example, when you buy a car, you may see two comparable cars because you like the car and look for a particular car and buy it based on that. That's okay. In the employee or in the employee arena, we don't want to be doing that. So, for example, we may have an opening in our in our department, and a couple people are interviewing, and we know that through personal knowledge that one of the employees has gone through a divorce, has three children. And we're concerned whether this person can make child care arrangements to arrive at work in time. That's an assumption. The question we need to ask this employee is, the shift starts at 645. Are you able to get here on time? Yes or no? 
And the answer generally would be yes. But we may have some other knowledge, and we don't want to be making that our decisions based on this other knowledge. Another example, someone comes in for a job interview, and they might be walk, walking with a cane. We don't want to assume that they can't do that job, the, the job that they're interviewing for. They might have a cane because they played basketball the weekend and twisted their ankle. But we might assume that they can't do their job. So again, when we think about making business decision, object or criteria, not subject or criteria. Again, I said this earlier, subject or criteria is OK. Uh, but, and, but it may uh, expose the manager to unnecessary business risk. Here's something I like to use or have used in the past. If you're, if you're hiring people for a specific position, you can list all the candidates, as you see on the left-hand side, and across the horizontal bar, the specific criteria that you're going to be interviewing against. And this is great documentation. So if someone comes back later and says, well, you didn't hire me because of this, this, or this, you can say, no, I based it on these uh, criteria. And I've had this, I, I have had a situation within my own department where a couple people are very qualified for the same one opening. I knew both of them for at least seven to 10 years, worked with both of them. So I set up a hiring grid like this so that when I had to defend my decision, if I had to, I could say my decision was based on this. Again, object or criteria, not subject or criteria. And this will help minimize um, business risk and lawsuits. The FACT model is a good way to use objective criteria. We follow objective criteria. We avoid assumptions. We comply with law and policies. And again, we treat situations consistently. So this is a good model with all types of business decisions. And we're going to go over an example in a minute. I'm just going to talk briefly about Family Medical Leave Act, only because it's a real big federal act. We, as managers, don't need to know all the ins and outs of, the, of, the, of FMLA. We just need to know that if an employee has certain life situations, that they're entitled to time off with, and their job is protected. And it's always best with FMLA to get help, to come consult with HR, because they know the most about the ins and outs of FMLA. But generally, FMLA, or Family Medical Leave Act, should be granted when a person has a birth or adoption for their serious health condition or that of immediate family or their own. So for example, if someone is going to be out because of a knee replacement, you know, they're entitled to, to time off with their job being protected. Again, we're not going to spend a lot of time with this. I just bring it up because this is one of the ones that's really tricky for managers, and sometimes managers may deny a request without knowing all the uh, specifics about it. So again, this is one example where you definitely want to get help from HR. Again, this is just some bullet points that HR will know about, about how the law protects the employee. So again, with FMLA, we want to minimize the risk. We want to be consistent professional against the organization and get help. Let's talk about religious accommodations. In this particular situation, um, you write a memo out about an upcoming event. You've created a timeline of when people will need to work. People had already planned to be off those days, but this just came up. Uh, out of the blue, it's a top priority of your organization. So you can create a timeline where everyone's responsible for working different shifts, even though originally people had planned to be off because they're going to be doing an outside event. So you create this timeline, you get it out to everyone, and all of a sudden you get a phone call on your voicemail, and Beth calls up and says that she's not able to work on the 11th or 12th because her church is having a rites of prayer, of, uh, prayer convocation. She states that she knows she's supposed to give you 30 days notice for days off, but she became active in her church again. And what do you do as a manager? So Beth basically is saying, I can't follow your schedule. I know this is short notice. I know we're supposed to give you 30 days notice for time off. Uh, but this just came up. So our immediate reaction might be, no way. Everyone's got to work this, this weekend. You didn't give me the notice. You need to work those shifts. However, the Supreme Court has ruled that employees must accommodate religious requests, provided that the request does not result in more than minimal economic hardships to the employee. 
So if someone comes up with, to us with a uh, request for religious accommodations, a good way to approach this is to use the fact model. We want to you know, gather the facts using objective criteria. We don't want to make assumptions about what this person's request is. Uh, we want to be consistent in our behavior, and we want to comply with laws and, and policies. As a manager, we should never question the employee about the details of their religion, even if their religion might be something that is less mainstream than what we're comfortable with or knowledgeable about. The employee is protected by law for religious accommodations. So the way we handle it is we document the nature of the request. Again, what's the relevant information? What's the date and times involved? We look at the business um, criteria for outlining the cost to us. We want to consult with HR because we want to know what past practices are. How has the organization handled, handled this in the past? And we don't want to uh, you know, refuse employees' requests on the spot. We don't want to, again, like we said in one of the earlier slides, react emotionally. We want to gather the information, document, get help, and be consistent. How have we handled this in the past? Again, hospitals are 24-7, 365. Um, everyone that works in a hospital knows that, and generally in human resources, when they're interviewing candidates, they'll talk about shifts and the, and, and the need to work different days of the week, and you know, the employee signs on that they're able to do that. Now, hospitals also try to accommodate people as best they can with cre creating the minimal amount of disruption. So they may allow people to trade different days of the week, which may be a religious holiday for one and not the other. Um, so again, hospitals are trying to be accommodating. You know, we had an example one time where someone called us uh, in our training department and asked us to change a training class because it was on a day that they uh, said was a religious holiday. To our knowledge, it wasn't on a major one, and we explained and we investigated and we said that we really couldn't change that. This person didn't have to attend that class, but with the number of classes we had, the limit on classroom space, we had to schedule classes on different days of the week, which may in fact fall on some religious holiday. But we were not discriminating, discriminating against this uh, particular person. If we're not able to re, uh, accommodate this person in, of course we want to give them the reasons or the justifications for it. Okay, so, so an example would be when an employee is subjected to adverse, this is some examples of religious discrimination. If we refuse to hire or promote someone based on their religious beliefs, for example, that they can't work overtime, that would be an example. Um, another example would be um, if we believe that a certain person's certain religious beliefs or clothing may interfere, or interfere with customers or make them or other people feel uncomfortable. Those could be examples of religious discrimination. Again, this is an excellent opportunity before before you make a decision, say, no, you can't wear that to work, or no, you can't do this, is we consult with human resources. Again, to minimize pretty much what we said all afternoon, avoid jokes, religious jokes or comments, use objective criteria. Again, it's the four prescriptive rules. Um, remember, we have a responsibility to attempt to accommodate that person, and um, we try to avoid major religious holidays. So true or false, you cannot require the employee to provide verification of religious affiliation that makes it necessary to request the accommodation. That's in fact false. You are not required. You're not required to okay a schedule change based just on the employee's request. And in fact, in some cases, the employer has had contact with the religious official to verify the need for the accommodation. So this particular question is false. Again, true or false, if an employee asks for time off or a schedule change because of a religious observation, you can require the employee to make their own arrangements by contacting other employees to cover the absence or swap. This, in fact, is true. It's not necessary for supervisors to take control and rearrange schedules for the employee. Judges do, however, look more favorably on the supervisor who tries to work with the employee uh, regarding the change. In the, in, the, um, early, in the example of Beth, 
probably one of the best uh, responses to this is, I understand you want, you want to be off those days. Um, I'm certainly going to work hard to grant you those days off. I want you to talk with some of the other employees. We're going to be out there for the whole five days. See if you can switch days or times. So put some of the responsibility back on Beth, and that is, in fact, okay to do. True or false, you cannot transfer an employee to a position that better suits the time requirements of the employee's religious observation. That, in fact, is true. Or, I'm sorry, that, in fact, is false. Let me go back over that. You cannot transfer an employee that suits them better. That is false. As long as the transfer doesn't involve a major demotion or other hardship on, on the employee, it is, in fact, okay to move the employee into a position that fits better for allowing time off or a schedule change. So we can do that as long as it doesn't mean a demotion or require a major hardship. The last case we're going to look at this afternoon is the case of Marsha and Bill. In this particular uh, situation, Marsha and Bill are coworkers. A billing error occurred between the two of them. The manager, based on their histories, um, decided to terminate Marsha's employment. If you look at Marsha, she's had three previous warnings. She's been retrained. Uh, Bill, however, on the other hand, has had no warnings, and precision is his strong point. The manager thought he made a sound decision. However, his decision was based on past history. He did not investigate the current situation. Martha, uh, Marcia, in turn, files a lawsuit based on racial discrimination. So here again, how does she get from being fired to racial discrimination? She's had three warnings. She's made mistakes in the past. Uh, Bill has never had a warning. Precision is his uh, strong point. He's never made a dis uh, error in the past. And this manager, thinking he's acting uh, appropriately, terminates Marsha's employment, and then his company gets uh, hit with a lawsuit based on racial discrimination. And as you look at the bottom, you see that Marsha is an African American and Bill is a Caucasian. This is a case of disparate treatment. In this particular case, we have two employees in a similar positions who were treated differently. And when this occurs, if there's not, again, as we talked about all afternoon, a legitimate business reason based on objective criteria to explain the differences, the courts may allow the jury to assume that the reason the decision was made was based on race, age, sex, ethnic origin, or disability. The law does allow inference of the discrimination to be raised if there's a difference in treatment. If the company does not have proof of a legitimate business reason, the company may lose the lawsuit because of an unlawful disparate treatment. So let's go back to that hiring grid I showed you earlier. Again, that would be one of the reasons to have the objective criteria across the top, the name of the candidates across the left-hand side. And we're basing that decision strictly on objective criteria. We're not basing it on uh, one of the protected classes. In the case of Bill, Marsha and Bill, the, the, the decision was made based by this manager, he thought, in good faith, because Marshall's had the error. So he based it on past history. He did not investigate. Um, he did not get help. He made a decision to terminate. And the course can rule that he made it based on race because he doesn't have their business criteria to say the objective criteria, this is why I did it. So race was introduced as a motivating factor. A factor in this case, the attorney for Marsh was able to show inconsistent tra treatment, and there's a failure to investigate. So again, following the prescriptive rules, don't make quick decisions, guard our words and actions, get help, investigate, and be inconsistent. So the definition, disparate treatment occurs when a manager behaves differently towards one employee based on, uh, or one employee in a given uh, job, class, or position based on, again, as we said this afternoon, race, sex, national origin, religion, disability, color, or age, or based on other factors not considered legitimate business reasons. Another example would, uh, of this would be, let's say, for example, a manager requires one employee who leaves early due to a religious reason to complete a timesheet, but doesn't require other people to do the same thing. 
this would be an example where the person can say, hey, I've, I'm being discriminated against based on my religion. I leave early. You know I'm going to this um, religious event. You're making me sign out on my timesheet. No one else has to do this. This would be an example of disparate treatment. Or if a manager gives longer lunch breaks to males or females, for example. Um, hopefully that's not occurring, but let's just say it does occur. And the female complains and says, you know, the only reason that he that Joe gets a longer lunch break is because you, you're a male and he's a male. And then she can bring a case against um, this employer and this manager for disparate treatment. Again, we want to go back to using the fact model, making decisions based on objective or criteria so that these other factors cannot be brought into play. So by way of summary this afternoon, we looked at four prescriptive rules. We talked about guarding our words and actions. And again, on a broader sense, when we talked about guarding our words and actions, we weren't just talking about our own words and actions, but the words and actions of those um, that we supervise that we work with, uh, that our colleagues of ours, that those that come into our in, um, organization, vendors, for example, that we're responsible for all those people. We talked about the importance of guarding not just our, our own words, but when we think about um, body language, you know, they say 90, 80 to 90 percent of our communication uh, might be nonverbal. So guarding our words, our expressions, how we look at people, a male, for example, how he looks at a female. Um, you know, is, is he doing it in a way that can be considered a hostile work environment? Guarding how we write things up in memos, uh, emails, um, correspondence, anything that can be brought into court. So again, guarding our words and actions. Secondly, we talked about the importance of investigating and documenting. Documentation uh, creates the timeline. It creates the record. It creates the um, events that can later be brought into court. And if we have a record of these things, it's easier to, to uh, bring our defense up because we have it documented. Also, the other thing that we have found over the last number of years is that in terms of document, documentation, employees are documenting as much as management staff these days. So it's not unusual for a situation where there might be um, an employee complaining to human resources or employee relations about a hostile work environment as an, and as the employee relations starts to investigate the case, that, that the employee has as much, if not more, documentation than the manager. So again, employees are documenting uh, on their own as well. And of course, we talked about investigating. When we investigate, it prevents us from jumping to a conclusion. It helps us use objective criteria. It prevents us from making assumptions about certain things that we might be easy to jump to conclusions about. So again, investigating and documenting. The third prescriptive rule we talked about this afternoon is getting help. Again, getting help is following policies and procedures. It's talking to our managers. It's talking to risk management. There's been numerous situations where uh, I myself or a colleague have talked to both human resources and risk management about certain, certain situations that might have to do with confidentiality. It might have to have to do with uh, policy. It might have to do with law. We wanted to make sure we were doing things consistent. So again, getting help. We are not expected as managers to know everything. We are expected to know key policies and procedures, key laws, and we are expected to get help. It's not as a sign that we don't know everything. It's a sign that we're trying to make the best decision. And again, when we get help, we're collaborating with other people, and that's looked favorably by, at, by the courts. The last prescriptive rule is being consistent and professional. How we do things on our department should be consistent, and it should be consistent with how the organization functions as a whole. So for example, if you allow flex time in your, in your department, if it's a policy that works with your department, it might not work with, with another department. So before you just say yes or no, you might want to check with human resources to see if it's something you can or cannot do, and just how we've handled this situation in the past. Again, with the one I brought up earlier about terminating an employee, that was a difficult decision because we, did, we didn't give a written warning, a verbal warning, a suspension. We went right to termination, but that was how we've handled those situations in the past. The employee uh, committed an offense that's considered a fireable offense on the first offense, which was falsifying billing. You know, had we looked at the policy and said, well, we generally 
suspend someone or we um, give them a written warning, then we would have followed that. So again, being consistent and professional. And hopefully these four prescriptive rules will help guide you as you continue to manage from this day forward. It's probably some of the things you may be doing. You might want to tweak some of the things you're doing based on the information you gleaned this afternoon. But hopefully it's not a, a, an overhaul to your whole management style. It's something that you can be uh, incorporating uh, into your own management style uh, fairly easily. We talked a lot this afternoon about the manager's duty to act. And again, this is a legal requirement. Managers are held to a higher standard than employees. When we, again, see any type of violation of policy or safety, any type of risk in the organization, whether it's to the patient, whether it's to the uh, employee, whether it's to the organization, we do, in fact, have a duty to act. It's the tip of the iceberg. And if we're not sure we have a duty to act, act anyways. Get help. Talk to your colleagues. Talk to your managers and ask, you know, is this something I need to get help about or we need to investigate? Using objective criteria versus subjective criteria in, in making business decisions. Again, um, using the FACT model, which we talked about, that's just a good model for us to follow. And lastly, by doing all these kinds of things, we're going to minimize the business risk to oneself and the organization. As we said earlier in today's presentation, uh, people are holding, or companies are, are, are the Supreme Court is holding managers more and more responsible for their behavior, especially if your organization has already taught us how we're supposed to behave in certain situations, and we want to see if we follow up with that. If we follow up with it, or our organization will um, defend us in court. If we, if we haven't taken the mandatory classes, if we're not doing the things we're supposed to do, we're likely to go to court uh, more on our own. A lot of this information came, comes from a, a, a course taught by uh, Stephen Pascoff. He's an attorney uh, in Atlanta. His company is E-Like Inc. If you want more information about his company, you can certainly find that uh, on his web page. And then lastly, uh, this is my contact information. You're certainly welcome to contact me if there's any questions or um, anything you want more information like about, something that's not clear. We do have a couple minutes. If there is a question that you want to ask it either, uh, email it, I'm sorry, or chat it, or um, ask it. We certainly have a minute or two. But again, if you don't feel comfortable with that, please feel free to contact me. Does anybody have any questions for Pat? Thank you, Pat. And just a reminder to mute or unmute your lines, press star pound. I did hear some people talk about documentation. Um, some people wonder, you know, do I have to document everything that occurs? Not necessarily. I mean, you spend all your day just sitting at your desk at your computer and documenting. But those things that you think might cause risk or things that you want to recall later, you certainly want to document the timeline. Again, it's important the timeline, who you talk to, what policies are, are applicable, and what actions you, you took. Okay. Looks like somebody's typing a question right now, so we'll wait for that. Um, what if I, Pat, in the past, what if you participate in a mutual banter? And you will stop now after hearing this, but are you, can you still be held liable for what's happened in the past? So the question, I'm not sure if everyone heard it, but so what if you participate in some mutual banter, you go back to your department now and say, I've got some new information, this is something we can't do, and can you be held liable for what you did in the past? You can certainly, someone can certainly bring up a complaint about it, but if you are unaware in the past, then you may or may not be held liable. A lot can, I mean, if you, if you can show that you went to a class, you learned some things you didn't know before, your behavior has changed, this is what you're doing differently at this point in time, you're going back to your department, you're explaining your behavior in the past was inappropriate, you apologize, you agree to go move forward differently and watch the behavior of, of everyone in your uh, department, then um, you have a much stronger business case. Again, we're talking about minimizing business risk, not opening ourselves up. Certainly someone can bring up a complaint about something you said last week or last year, but if you can show that you're doing things differently now based on some new information, that's a much stronger business case. Okay, thanks, Pat. Any other questions from anybody?